Thanks for having me. Uh, I will talk about the Super Facility API, which is one of the outcome of the Super Facility project. And I'm going to do the first slide telling you what the Super Facility project was or is. Um, so um, as you might know, NURSE supports a large number of users and projects from DOE Office of Science Experimental Observation of Facilities. And then we made like a, um, an analysis a while ago and figured that um, a lot of these projects that we're having um, are actually use NERS to um, analyze experimental data or create tools for data analysis or combine experimental data with simulations modeling. And that makes the a data day uh, all the more important uh, to have. And there, what we also found is that we that these users um, that use it for data analysis, they're actually from uh, external facilities. So a lot of them, a lot of them are from external facilities of the DOE of, DO uh, of the science uh, programs. And um, from this, uh, um, you know, from this research, or from actually, or from all the from knowledge that LVL has in. Um, in working with experimental facilities or working between like, um, you know, NERSC and uh, the computation research division and the SNET is that, you know, that, that you can make better uh, science and you can actually make better results if you start uh, working together. And the super facility is the, is the ecosystem of connected facilities, software and expertise to enable new modes of discovery. And the super facility API, that was one part of the super facility project here at NERSC. And the idea is that you create an API into NERSC to embed HPC into cross facility workflows. And so it's kind of tailored, the beginning is tailored towards you know, the, the workflow tool developers and our facility uh, partners. But it's now also a general purpose API for all NERSC uh, users and projects. I'm just going to run through, through a model case to motivate. Um, the creation of the API. Um, so uh, in many cases, experiments at external facilities use high frame rate 2D detectors for their science, and these uh, produce a whole lot of data. And now they need um, to process that data. And um, hosting the data on site um, and compute on site has been increasingly demanding. So the uh, idea is why don't you use you know, an Oscar uh, HPC resource for this. And in order to make this work, you know, they need to know that HPC um, is a reliable partner. So they need to kind of figure out that uh, the status machine readable, they need to they need to know that if I switch from one HPC facility to another, that you know I can I can use the same tool. Um, and the other requirements like you know real-time turnaround, you know, that maybe you know the the people who are from an external facility here in the audience can speak about. Um, but the, the usual steps to run such a workflow are often the same. So first you need to check um, if your HPC facility, HPC facility is up. You need to check the status or you need to check if you have enough you know, um, hours to run the job. You need to move the data over to NERSC. Um, you, need to start, you need to start the actual analysis job and you, need to, you kind of want to monitor you now. Is the job still working? Is it done? You kind of need to, um, you know, tail in the logs or something like this. And then, um, then you want to make one also, you know, gather some feedback. So you want to download some intermediate data or some, some, um, you know, initial result. And then uh, you probably want to move the data to archive after analysis, or you want to move it back to the site where it came from. So this, um, this, this use case kind of motivates a lot of the endpoints of the API. So the, the API, um, why did we actually go and uh, make yet another one? But so, so the APIs are very important. They, they meet a critical need in a super facility ecosystem. Automation is no longer optional. It, will, it, would, it allows for unintended operation. It minimizes the human in the loop. You know, you can track, you know, your number of jobs and um, you wanna maybe have like some, you have like an experiment set up, you know, that, uh, many other users come through and that you want to run it through like a machine or user account and you kind of want to build this, you know, this very good um, workflow where you kind of integrate uh, HPC um, into your workflow. And an API allows you um, to, to uh, get, make the HPC resource kind of machine readable that allows for an easier integration, kind of gives you this feeling like, okay, well, here's my 
great user interface and I'm running out of resources on my local servers. Now I want to switch on to like a remote server and it should be as easy as, you know, selecting an HPC resource from like a top, from like a, a menu or just click a button and then suddenly the job, you know, will, the data will be delivered to NERSC and the job will run at NERSC. So that's something that my API is really good for. And also the other reason why we made a new one is um, there's so much good standardized tooling out there that it's really not a reason to, uh, to not build an API. And what we want to be at in the end is you kind of want to, you kind of want to, in this ecosystem of connected facilities, like on the right, you see UAD, that's experimental observational data facilities. And on the left, you see HPC. You kind of want to get into the business of uh, having like these closed loop workflows where, you know, they run the, they have the workflows at the local site and they kind of can embed HPC uh, as they want to. So what the API uh, can do today, um, well, you have a number of uh, endpoints available, for example, uh, status. So you can create the status of nurse, nurse component system help. And we will see that in the um, demo too. And you can check the accounts. You can, of course, um, submit compute jobs and, and check if your job is done or not, um, queue statuses. Then you can transfer files. Um, a bunch of these things actually run uh, asynchronously. So you have to check in like the tasks endpoint where every every um, endpoint that runs asynchronously kind of like um, gives you a task feedback and then you know you check on the task endpoint how, how um, the specific um, uh, action is working and we also have smaller utilities you know up and up and download uh, but also you know executing uh, arbitrary commands and reservations yet to yet to come so the idea is that all nurse interactions are callable and you know the backend tools that are sent behind these endpoints assist in large and uh, complex operations. So let's maybe take a look at uh, how that's done, um, you know, in detail. So let's say if you if you were to check the status, you know, um, you can go uh, and go to nurse MOTD or you can uh, SSH and ping specific services. But you know, with the API, you can just go to status and and query the status endpoint and uh, Get the information you need. Or submit job, you know, SSH in, S batch, you know, this done by the compute endpoint, monitor job, SQ is done also by the computer endpoint and uh, also by the task endpoint. And yeah, and for accounting, like you would go into Iris and look at the accounting web page. And this is, you can do uh, parts of that functionality with the uh, account API. Okay. So let's check how this would uh, turn out for this model use case. Uh, first, plan check ability of nurse resource per experiment. You know, in this case, you would go for the status endpoint. Moving the data over, you would go to the storage transfer endpoint. And then um, you start the analysis jobs, of course, with a compute endpoint and check in on the compute jobs with over the task endpoint. And then you gather feedback, you know, downloading small files. You can do this with utilities or you can use the storage endpoint again. And moving the data to archive also with the storage endpoint. Okay, so um, this is, was, was just like the model case, motivates like all the different endpoints. But we have um, the, if you've been to the super facility day, a uh, couple of days, like last, was it wasn't last week, I think it was last week. Anyway, a bunch of our um, science engagement actually use the super facility API today. And I'm gonna show uh, one science example. And that's my, um, that's the National Center for Electron Microscopy, who's also on, on LBL campus. Um, and they have, if you look on the right, on the left, they have like a bunch of um, electron microscopes. And there's one specifically that's is called the 40 STEM. It's a, a lot of, um, it's a very high frame rate, very high um, bandwidth a detector. It's a bunch of FPGA modules. And it puts the data at like four times 120 gigabits per second onto receiver nodes and then pushes it on, a, on an intermediate flash storage buffer. And they used, they built like an app called the Distill app. And that, uh, that app actually instruments a pull into um, uh, the community file system or so Cori Scratch or uh, Permuter Scratch. And from then it initiates a process that's called um, uh, electron counting. So essentially they have all this raw data and they reduce it 
to just the electron counts on the detector. It's a very drastic uh, reduction. Um, and this has also been done uh, with, the, with the API. And then afterwards, the results were much smaller are saved to the community file system. So with the help of the API and, on the, and the NERSC ecosystem, they were able to cut down the, the processing time. And now this is a very regular, um, um, this is, I think this is just, it's a, production, it's a production app and it runs all the time for them. So here's like some overview. This is just essentially a basic, like a catalog and a catalog app. So you have all your data sets in there and you can kind of click on it and, and check them out. Um, and I think I have a screencast too. All right, let's go through this. I've been showing this quite often. So, you know, um, it's made by Chris Harris from Kitware in, in collaboration with Peter Urshius from NCM. So they made the screencast. So essentially they're looking at like one data sets and which we'll see in a minute, and uh, you're gonna press on this count button. And this count button is everything that this app does to kind of instrument this workflow over the API. So it pulls the data over with BB copy, uh, it runs electron counting code. And then you now after a while it's done, so the state gets this check mark. And then, um, uh, and then all the work is done. So this is kind of, uh, I kind of like this a lot because it kind of shows what you can do with an API. And essentially for the user, it's absolutely, um, they're absolutely unaware that it's actually running at NERSC. It's kind of like, it's kind of hidden. It has this NERSC uh, inside uh, feature that I really like. All right. Um, I'm gonna now go into how to use the API and talk a bit about it. I'm going to show some demos too. So uh, Super City 8 Basics, uh, if you go to this URL above the API, that's the golf API slash version 1.2, it will actually go to uh, this Swagger page. And the Swagger page shows you all the endpoints that the API currently offers, and you can actually go and try them out. Uh, we're gonna can only try out like in this particular form. We can only try out like uh, stuff that's um, doesn't require authorization. So you can press execute if you wanted to. This takes a bit of a while. Oh, yeah. So here you see like the response. Um, you know this 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 checks if all the if the uh, different services of NERSC are uh, active or not, or uh, the app or not. And you can see, for example, that perimeter here. Um, is currently um, in a scheduled maintenance. So it's unavailable, this one. While Cori is, is active, maybe it's a bit small, but we, uh, it's gonna be in the demo anyway. Um, so yeah, I invite you to try this out. This is just doesn't require any author, any authorization whatsoever. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the, um, the API is a REST API with JSON input output, standards based authentication. So using OAuth here, OAuth tokens, um, so standard bearer token. And um, we have a lot of documentation for this. So if you go to this web page um, in, in docs and docs as of API, you can see all the um, all the information we have about the, the API. Uh, and what's kind of cool, I just checked uh, the latest logs on Kibana and uh, from May 1st, we have 4 million uh, locked requests. And this is it's essentially like one request every three seconds, and these are only the uncached ones. So I think there's even more. It's a higher load on the API, but yeah, every every three every three seconds it has to run a, a new a, a process that's not been cached in the system. Okay, um, so if you want to use the API, right, I showed you that you can just move over to the Swagger page. But they will only give you access to um, the public endpoints. You know, if you want to use um, authorized uh, authenticated endpoints, you need to get a Superficity API client. You see it on the right, and I will show you in a minute how, how to get one in Iris when I go to the demo. Um, and I think that's all to the slides. I'm just gonna gonna do this now. It's gonna be a live demo, so fingers crossed. It worked. It worked just 20 minutes ago, and if it doesn't work, I have a video. <laughs> Video recording of it. Okay. All right. So let's go um, to Iris. So I'm already logged in. Um, and you can see this is the standard Iris page. You go to profile. Um, maybe we should just make this a bit uh, 
larger, yeah. Okay. All right, so in the profile page at the very bottom, uh, you see Superficity API clients. So you go here, uh, you make a client, and if you're um, if you have never used the API, you probably only get the read-only client. But if you want, but there is another client that allows you also to execute code. It's, impos it's important for all the post requests. All post requests require the read-write execute client, which also the is um, which also includes the submitting a compute job. So if we need this. This will require this will trigger security uh, review. Um, but I already managed to do that, so I can <laughs> I can have it. Let's give it a name. Uh, let's call it Cori Demo Two, and then we select an, a source IP range, and we're going to call the API from inside the Cori nodes in this already uh, preset that you can get from uh, this user interface. We create a client, uh, and then we're going to copy the the information, and I'm going to deactivate the client right afterwards. So uh, hope nobody screams at me for uh, for sharing this one in this screencast. Um, let's go back, copy your key. It's kind of uncommon this one. So then what I have here is a Jupyter notebook that demonstrates the use of the API. You don't really, you don't need to use a Jupyter notebook. You can use like any, um, like any place where you want to call it from, but it's just convenient to show it in a, in a notebook here, right? We have some convenience wrappers that, that handle, that deal with the communication, just gonna go. But this doesn't, it's not really important though. All right, so the first thing we do is in this particular part, we exchange the client credentials for a token. So now we got an you know we got an access token back. It's a bearer token, and we can use this token now to um, to um, submit requests to the API. Um, but first, we start with the user checkup, and that's the you know we're gonna gonna follow this model. Um, that uh, you know we're trying to we're like an ex we are like an external facility. And we try to run, um, we try to move data over there and we try to run our, our job, right? So the first thing we do is we want to check if the system is up, right? We checked for Cori, it's up. And here's have a bunch of um, a bunch of other calls that's, that check for other systems, Cori, Permadat, uh, like the data transfer nodes, the community file system, Globus, all these services might be important for you if you want to run your workflow. So we execute this. And we see, you know, Cori active, permit unavailable, as it was just like a couple of minutes ago. Um, data transfer nodes work, global, the community file system works, and uh, Globus works, and at least according to our multi information. Okay, that means you're gonna have to select a uh, Cori. But if you if you want to also be future looking, you can also check out um, future plant outages. There are like an outages plant. That's the endpoint you need to check for. If you go for this, then we see that there's only one currently only one Cori uh, maintenance planned and 16th of November. Okay. So now that we know that Cori will be available and uh, most of the services uh, will be available too, we can start to run a transfer. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't activate my endpoint, so I'm um, I'm just going to jump over to next. Assume this one worked. And apologies for that. In the videos that will come with this slide, you see that. It will, we see that it's working. Um, OK, so now let's create a job. This is just a simple aspect script that we're, uh, that we're creating here. And then we pipe it in uh, with a cut command. And we use the command endpoint, utilities command for this. And for this, you need to be authenticated to run it. So press this. And this, as this is uh, a post command, it will be it. Uh, will trigger, it will run asynchronously. So what we're doing is we're checking uh, the task every now and then. So let's see what, what you see here with polling. So I polled like um, seven, uh, seven times to see if the task was done. And you see at some point it changed to completed. I can, I can just redo it once, once more. So it starts with new. And some point when this file has been written, it will change to completed here. And you can see on the left side, 
that file has been written. That's, that's the beauty of using Jupyter here. Your file browser gives you like this feedback right away. Okay, but you don't actually have to use like this feature. You can also just use the um, LS, LS um, utility. And uh, we have an endpoint for this in the API too. So you can run this. This is actually not uh, asynchronous. We'll give you a result right away. And you see that the file has been written. All right, now that we have our job file done, uh, we can submit uh, to the queue. And if you paid attention before, I was using um, the real-time queue. So hopefully uh, this will be done uh, fast. Let's see. All right. So it's been submitted. So it got, it got a job ID back. And we save this job ID from the response here. And we use it to query uh, how the job is doing. So we look at this one. And if you pay attention to the left, you see that the Slurm file has popped up. So the job is actually running now. Um, but you can also do it by checking um, on the compute jobs, query, job ID, um, endpoint. So if you, and we can now uh, inspect how the process is doing, but you can actually tail, we can use the command endpoint to, to um, take a look at the output file from Slurm. Since this is command, it will actually uh, be executed asynchronous again. Um, so we pull it. And hopefully in a second, there you go. So what you see here now is that the job has started. This is actually a typography code that's running. And you see that, you know, here's this iteration and iteration. So there's not a job running in the background. Um, it will take a minute, uh, but um, I think we're just gonna press on forward. So what you do in the end, you can, you know, read the file and extract where the, where the uh, result has been written to. And then now we're just going into just standard Jupyter here and go to the, go and find the file and visualize the results. All right. So you can do this all of the API, but at this point I was getting lazy. And so I'm just gonna just use Jupyter for this part, but just to reaffirm that everything's working all right. Okay, um, right. Did this. This were our example. This is uh, two videos that show you how to work on Perimeter and uh, Cori. Let's go through this. Okay. Um, right. I show this in the end. In the in the end. Okay. So we're coming now to the end of the API. Um, I'm going to I'm going to tell you a bit what's coming up next. Um, so. Uh, what we're going to do next is we want to uh, kind of redo clients and tokens to uh, have a bit more granular scope. Currently, you only have read, write, execute, or read. So we're going to go for more. We're going to make it more based on like kind of what the actual um, you know thread the individual endpoints do, and then you get like kind of a um, have a traffic light. Um, scale on which you can can you can slide for your endpoint, and then you can select. Um, you know, an endpoint that kind of matches kind of how long you want to run it for and how many IP address ranges you need. And then you can see how many, what kind of endpoints it gets, or you can see vice versa. I want to use this particular function of the API. And then the, the new client interface will tell you, you know, what the, what the AP limitations and lifetime limitations are. But the, the upside is we have going to have much more source IP ranges per client. There was a popular user request. And also we will go to just like you can today, uh, you can get like a 24 hour SSH proxy credential to, uh, to run your workflows. Now you can have like um, full feature clients that are for a short lifetime, uh, but you don't have to go through the review process, you know, which, which otherwise takes quite a while. So I'm quite excited about this and this should be right around the corner. So the next thing we wanna do is run the SF API to retire mute. Um, this is supposed to be on a month time scale, and uh, we, the the way it works is you're gonna have a there will be a login based route to get tokens from uh, for miners, sense gateway apps, other web apps. 
So you know, Newt will retire, and SF API will become the new uh, the new backend for everything API at NERSC. And also, an exciting thing that we are we're working on is we're working on a common API interface because the super facility API is only good enough if it actually enables you to run, you know, super facility type workflow. So if you can switch between facilities, so important for this is that we get other facilities on board that adopt the same endpoints and methods. And we are currently talking uh, with CSCS um, that have developed the Firecrest API it was kind of like the blueprint for the super facility API. So we, we, we based a lot of our design of the Firecrest API also talking with the uh, high performance computing services at LBL, S3DF at Slack, and um, the, the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. So this will form a nucleus that will, will um, create like an API that can that is the same across many facilities and will, will allow you to uh, easily migrate your workflows uh, between between those facilities. And I think I'm gonna stop here for questions rather than showing another video. So thanks so much. <laughs>